Welcome everybody. My name is Laura Horwood Benton and I am the Public Programming and Community Relations Librarian at Portsmouth Public Library in New Hampshire. I use she, her as pronouns. I'd like to start this evening with our land acknowledgement. The city of Portsmouth is on the homelands of the Abenaki people who have ongoing cultural and spiritual connections to this area. According to tribal oral tradition, Abenaki people have lived in the place now called New Hampshire for more than 12,000 years, since before tribal memory. The Abenaki are part of a larger group of indigenous people who called themselves Wabanaki, or people of the dawn, and form one of many communities connected by a common language family. Here at Portsmouth Public Library, we are committed to acknowledging and honoring the human history tied to this land. And because this is a program for parents and caregivers, I'll just give a shout out to Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective. You can find them online at indigenousnh.com. They've just released a new set of resources and teaching guides for um, caregivers and educators. So um, if this is an area that interests you and you wanna to talk to more with your children about it, I encourage you to check them out and I can share that in the chat a little bit later. Um, so this event tonight will go until 8.30 p.m. We plan to be respectful of your time. A couple of practical notes. This is a webinar, so we can't see or hear you. However, you're welcome to ask questions as we go, either in the Q&A section or the chat, and there'll be a little bit of an opportunity to interact. Um, if you'd like to remain anonymous, you can ask anonymous questions in the Q&A, and you can also change your name if you'd like to write in the chat. Um, this evening's program is being recorded and we will make the recording available on YouTube in a couple of weeks so you can share it with folks who may have missed the presentation. I've also turned on subtitles for this event for increased accessibility. You can toggle them on and off by selecting more at the bottom of your screen and then clicking show subtitle or hide subtitle. If you have any questions about library services or upcoming programs, feel free to ask those in the chat. I did wanna say that this program is part of an ongoing series we've been offering um, called the Birds and the Bees, Sex Ed for Adults. You can view a couple of our past programs from this series on our YouTube page. So I'll share that link in the chat in a little while as well. One of them was a fantastic talk by Emily Nagoski, author of Come As You Are, who was a recent guest on Glenn and Doyle's podcast. So I feel like, you know, I had a brush with fame. Um, we love hearing from you about what you'd like to see at the library, so I will also share an online event feedback form. If you fill it out, you'll not only help the library, you'll also be entered to win a library book bag. So we're very excited tonight to welcome Jen Deldeo. Jen is the Religious Education Coordinator at South Church, a Unitarian Universalist community in Portsmouth. In that capacity, she offers comprehensive sexuality education programs for children and youth, including secular curricula. That's hard to say. Together with the Director of Lifespan Ministry, she also offers a range of support options to parents who are the primary sexuality educators of their own children. So we're really excited to hear more about what you have to say, Jen, so welcome. Hi, Laura, thank you so much. And um, thank you for doing this series. I think it's so important and good work and something our culture desperately needs. So I appreciate the opportunity to participate and for the, the scope of the whole project that you're doing. Um, and thank you for people who are here watching. Um, I know there's a lot going on right now and it's hard to make time for things. So I appreciate um, those of you who are able to make that space. So I, um, before we start, I wanna acknowledge the sensitivity of this topic and that um, unfortunately, sexuality topics have a high potential for triggers. Um, due to trauma that so many people have. So I wanna encourage anyone to practice really good self-care um, as you are here this evening. Um, pay attention to your body and your emotions and just recognize anything that you experience and make sure you do what you need to feel good and healthy and to get what you need out of our time together. So as Laura said, my job is um, the religious education coordinator at South Church. And one part of that is administering sexuality education programs for um, children of all ages um, through high school. And we also work with parents. We started offering up parents and caregivers as sexuality educators um, in the spring. That was really well received and we plan to offer that again. Um, and I sometimes I'm really surprised that my job is church and sex and um, my 25 year old self would have been 
horrified to know that at 46, I would be working full time for church and teaching kids about sex. But um, I think it makes sense to to explain why those two are together, how how um, sexuality education in church makes sense. Um, the the program that we teach, the curricula we use, is called Our Whole Lives, or OWL, and um, that is a program that was developed by the Unitarian Universalist and United Church of Christ faith communities together. Um, I actually have a slide, and I have to remember how to share first, and then, hold on, excuse my tech. screen and share screen. Oop, we'll go back. There we go. Yeah, so the Our Whole Lives curriculum um, is comprehensive, so it covers a, a really wide range of topics. It's lifespan, recognizing that we are sexual beings from the time we are born and before um, until we die. And um, it, was, it is secular, even though it was developed by two church communities. Um, there is no religion, no dogma, nothing, nothing to do with church in the curricula. It was really just um, born out of a recognition that sexuality education is a social justice topic and that it was just really widely um, missing from our culture, from schools and from other places. Um, so these two churches decided that this was necessary. Um, the curricula is, it provides accurate and developmentally appropriate information with the idea that um, knowledge and information keeps people safe and empowers people to make healthy decisions. Um, there are currently seven curricula in the OWL program. There's one starting with kindergarten and first grade, then four, fourth through sixth, seventh through ninth, tenth through twelfth, and then there are three different adult curricula. There's a young adult, what I call a regular adult, and an older adult. And so at South Church, we, we offer the program when kids are in fifth grade, in seventh grade and um, combination 10th and 11th grade together. And we were just getting ready to offer the kindergarten and first grade curriculum when COVID hit. So that's that's on pause. We don't currently um, offer the adult OWL, but that, that is on our on our list when we have the, the capacity and resources to offer that. Um, so kids growing up in our community um, know that that this is coming. Most of the kids in the South Church community take OWL and um, they grow up knowing it's ahead and some kids are really excited about it and enjoy that as kind of a rite of passage and others don't. Plenty of other kids do not look forward to it and do not enjoy going, but I really haven't ever heard of kids after the fact um, saying that they wish they hadn't done it. Um, they overwhelmingly say it was hard and awkward, but um, I'm glad I did it. So the yeah, OWL values, even though it's um, secular, it's not value free. Um, so these are what, these are the values that OWL um, promotes. Self-worth, sexual health, responsibility, and justice and inclusivity. So if you can get on board with those values, then that's as churchy as it gets. So I, before talking about directly um, parenting children around sexuality, um, I wanted to show this slide, this visual called the circles of sexuality, because I think it's really helpful in just outlining what sexuality is, because it's so much more than intercourse or puberty, which is what most schools are teaching and the kind of the, the parts we focus on. So in the circles of sexuality, it, it shows us um, basically five categories in these outer circles. Um, and this isn't, you know, perfect. These, these things don't really all belong in separate boxes, but it helps our kind of sciencey human brains to, to develop a full picture of, of sexuality. So 
starting here at the top with sensuality. This is how we feel about our bodies and how our bodies feel. Moving over to intimacy. This can be um, emotional intimacy with any kind of a relationship, whether it's friends or family or romantic partners. Um, and so, you know, intimacy is closeness and sharing, whether that's of um, in a relationship that is sexual or not. Sexual identity is how we identi identify ourselves as it relates to gender. So um, our gender identity, our biological sex, our, how we express gender, who we're attracted to in relation to gender. Sexual health and reproduction is the area that um, a lot of schools focus on with um, anatomy and physiology and intercourse and kind of the sciencey parts of sexuality. And sexualization is, it holds a lot of the darker parts of sexuality. Um, and so some schools, I think, include some of this with regard to sexual harassment or um, consent, but it's using uh, sexuality to influence others. But then in the middle here, um, is values because our, our own personal values overlay all of this and that's really what most affects our decisions and our views around um, sexual ed sexuality, whether it's um, our sexual behaviors or our perceptions. And that's especially where parents come in. And yeah, I just wanted to say that approaching sexuality education with all of those circles in mind can really um, help us take the, the, um, the intensity off of some of the, the topics that people tend to be afraid of, like masturbation or um, intercourse. When we see that, that sexuality is a whole lot of things and can come into our um, everyday conversations, um, I think it, it really makes the whole topic easier to approach. So the, the primary number one rule in OWL is that parents are the primary sexuality educators of their children. So no matter how comprehensive the programming is, um, and parents send us their kids and we give them all this information and we engage them in conversations and activities and, um, and we support parents, but when it comes down to it, parents are still um, the biggest influencers of their children when it comes to any any sexuality education. And this, um, this graphic illustrates that. This is from um, a, a website called Power to Decide, which is great. I, I do have a list of resources that I'll um, share with Laura to make available. Um, so this is a, a really interesting graphic. So I'll zoom in with this. Oops, not too much. Um, so this is a closer up on what the bulk of that last slide was. And so it's broken down by um, age groups of teens. And then on the, on the right over here, it also breaks it down between um, non-Hispanic white people, non-Hispanic black people and Hispanic people. But those are all together in these age groups. And you can see ages 12 to 15 parents by far are the biggest influence on um, their children when it comes to um, talking about sex. By 16 to 19, parents have lost a little bit of ground to friends, but still, still in the lead. 20 and 21, friends are a lot more of um, an influence in regards to sexuality, um, but parents still hold quite a bit of influence. And then parents start to gain ground again um, in mid-20s. So it's really important to recognize that um, whether you are being intentional or not, you're teaching your kids a lot about sexuality already. So even if we're not talking to them directly, there's so much that kids are learning um, from us. So, you know, things like the way that we interact with others, the way we show affection, um, how, we respond, how we respond to different media, um, whether we comment on images on billboards or um, the music that we listen to and what the messages are in there and um, the way we treat our bodies. There's so many messages that we're already giving, whether, whether they're spoken or not. 
So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. So I think one really valuable thing in, um, oh, I see a question, is the third down media? Yeah, third, media is the, it's the third in the top three influencers of kids around sexuality, which is a little bit scary because media is everywhere. You know, if we're talking about um, music and movies and um, magazines and newspapers and books, and um, there's so, so much and, it's quite influential. So yes, thank you for asking that question. Um, so as we're approaching, you know, being intentional around um, talking to kids about sexuality, it's important to think about our own sexuality and the messages that we received growing up. And so I'll just have us think, have you all think for a moment of what messages you did receive around sexuality, um, what was said and what was unspoken. Um, if you if you would like to share, you're welcome to put responses in the chat. And I understand if you don't want to. And it's it, there's a wide range in this from um, different people. I've done this with a lot of groups, and it's great when we can see the results or hear the results. We can't do that um, here, but um, it is no matter what. It's helpful to think about your your own messages and and sometimes we can start to think about that and we think one thing but then after just having planted that seed we can start to realize more and more of the messages we received for example i always considered my um family to be one that did not give any messages about sexuality we didn't talk about it i remember one time on the way home from somewhere at night riding with my mom and i'm strapped in my seatbelt, and she just went for it and told me all the things that I was going to be getting my period and what I needed to do to deal with that secretly. And, and that was kind of our, our one talk that we had. But then later in my life, I realized that there were a lot of, a lot of um, unspoken messages that I also received in the way my parents were affectionate with each other or um, fancy underwear that I would find in the laundry and all different kinds of things like that. And, and I, I did get messages that, that sex is a fun and healthy and pleasurable experience. I just didn't um, understand till later that I had received those messages. So then after thinking about the messages that you received growing up, um, it's important to think about the messages that you want your children to receive. Um, pausing there, I see there are a few responses here. Someone said sex was wrong before marriage is a message they received. My parents didn't speak to me about sex. Communication for my parents was very healthy. So this person was lucky. Um, they got lots of books, but the social, social and media messages were devastating. It did not seem socially acceptable for girls to experience sexual desire, only act as objects. So much in, in media, and I wonder if that person's parents ever addressed that with them, if there were ever conversations about that. Um, this person said, did not talk about it otherwise, no sex talk, including menstruation from parents ever. And that's very common, um, especially from people of my generation. It really is, has been a cultural thing, which I think is improving, but we need to keep doing this kind of work to really um, break that down. So thank you for sharing. So yeah, thinking about what kinds of messages do you want your kids to receive if you are a parent or if you're planning to be a parent. Um, and again, I invite you to share in the chat, um, you know, whether it's the same messages that you received or different messages you received or how you want kids to receive them. Think about that and be really intentional around it. And you don't have to know the answers. You don't have to know um, the specifics, but just um, spend a little time with that. And again, you can offer those in the chat if you would like. So this person says, raising a son and want to stress consent. That is a, a topic that comes up a lot right now. Understandable. We'll talk a little bit about that. And I, I will say, I think schools are getting better about addressing that. So I'm going to share again. Let me... Um, tech hat back on.
Yeah. So how do we do this? How do we talk to kids about sexuality? Um, it can be super scary because the awkward, anything awkward can be something that makes us shut down. But first of all, be brave. It doesn't have to be difficult. Embrace the awkward. I always, I always tell the kids in, um, in OWL classes that it, it's okay to feel awkward and to do something anyway that is awkward. Embrace the awkward. So to a little bit of specifics, how do we get there? Um, so we want to identify our own experience and articulate what we want for our kids. Um, that's, that's a significant first step. And then beyond that, there's just so many ways to incorporate conversations and learning with your kids. And we'll look at, we'll look at some of those suggestions in a little bit. Um, but we'll also focus on what to keep in mind and what sorts of framework to have in place. I have a quote from the, um, the parents and caregivers class that we started offering from the curricula. Um, no parent or caregiver can have complete and fully current facts. However, adults can establish an atmosphere of open, non-judgmental talk. They can point children and youth toward accurate information about sexual behaviors, risks, and precautions. And most importantly, they can nurture a child's holistic sense of well-being across emotional, psychological, and social aspects of life. So, um, yeah, so how do we do that? How do we get there? Ideally, um, we'll start early and have conversations often. That's not always the reality. Maybe you have um, children who are teens already and it's just time to get started, that's okay. It's not too late, it's never too late. Um, but ideally, as soon as you can start talking to kids, you can start having conversations. And the more that we incorporate conversations around sexuality into our everyday lives, the easier it gets and the less, um, the less intense some of the more traditionally awkward conversations can be. By the time you get to intercourse and masturbation, it won't feel as stressful. Keep in mind that we won't be perfect. We will definitely make mistakes and that's okay. We can fix those mistakes, um, but it's important to just get started and start talking. It's great for parents to have a community to um, share information together, um, share resources, vent about what's going on and process um, the things that are coming up, whether in your process of educating your children or um, things that your children are experiencing that you're not quite sure how to approach yet. So it's good to have a peer group and to practice together. You can even do some role playing on how to talk to kids, which sounds really hokey and um, not a lot of people are going to do that. But if you try it, it's actually really fun. It's a fun thing to do among friends. One person pretend to be the kid asking a question and the Parent, um, other person practicing answering that. So it feels silly, but it's actually pretty fun with friends. Um, bring up topics when you see them. So everywhere, like the person that mentioned the uh, media messages, maybe you're watching a show together and something comes up in that about the way someone is being treated. It's okay to stop the show, pause the show, um, and address it right there and be like, what do you think about what just happened? Or if you see a billboard with an image that um, could spark a conversation. The slide right here that sparked one in my household the other day. So this is from just a quick search for kids clown costume. If you notice the one on the left is the boys killer clown costume. It's very aggressive and he's got this <laughs> crazy weapon and um, fully covered head to toe, literally 100%. And then this one says creepy clown girl's costume. And I don't know why it has to be sexy, but I feel like so many um, costumes designed for girls and women are short skirts and these knee high stockings. Um, so I had a brief conversation with my 11 year old about this. Why is it this way? So they're Opportunities everywhere. 
Um, also be aware of what we aren't saying. Again, we're, we're giving messages all the time. So just being aware of uh, the things we're, we aren't saying directly to kids, um, not talking about sexuality gives a message that this is something that we're not supposed to talk about, which isn't a healthy approach. Um, be aware of how you treat or talk about others. And hopefully you're already modeling really positive things, but be aware that kids are listening all the time. They have great ears, especially when they think, or especially when we think they're not listening. Um, pay attention to the way that you comment about different bodies or um, also whether or not you speak up about someone else's comments, if you hear negative comments that your kids are watching you to see how you respond to things like that. And this is especially where your values come in. If you remember from that circles of sexuality chart and the, the values circle in the center. So that, that's the kind of place where your values will have a big impact on the kids. Get ahead of their exposure. Um, kids are going to hear things, whether we want them to or not, from their peers and all kinds of places. Um, school buses and playgrounds are famously um, filled with uh, topics of sexuality among kids who have heard things from older siblings or all kinds of other places. And a lot of times that information be, can be confusing um, or downright wrong. It can be just false. I don't even know where some of the information I've heard comes from. So kids can handle more than we think. Don't be afraid to get a little bit ahead of what you think they know or, or what you think they're ready for. Um, you, you know your kids and it's not likely that you will traumatize them by um, talking with them. So give them as much as, as you can without harming them. And you're not likely to harm them. <laughs> Having books in common areas um, is great modeling. It shows that we're not ashamed to um, talk about bodies and sexuality. Um, it also gives the opportunity for kids to pick up and browse at their own leisure, whether that's in the living room or in the bathroom. Books in their bedrooms are great too, so they can explore a little bit on their own with, with books. And I did put some books in the resources list also. Make sure you're answering the questions that they're asking. And that can be that can be tricky, especially when um, a child asks a question like, "Where do babies come from?" It can be something that freezes us if we're nervous about answering that question. So make sure you ask them exactly what they are asking you, so that you're giving the answer that that they need and not overwhelming them with something that they aren't even asking you about. And likewise, keep it simple. Um, don't over talk when they ask a question, because if if um, if they ask you a simple question related to sexuality and and nervousness just makes you talk and talk and talk and over answer their question, it might make them less likely to ask the next time. So keep it simple. You can always come back and add more later or ask them if they want to know more. Make it fun. This is one that I like a lot. Um, talking about sex and other sexuality topics doesn't have to be stressful or bad, and it can be actually really fun. Um, I, I, my favorite is uh, to use the game Bananagrams. This kind of came spontaneously one night. Um, we played a, a regular round of Bananagrams, and then um, I just started a second round and I said, this time we're all gonna work on the same um, let it, words together. We're all gonna make one um, connected set of words, but this time we're only gonna use words that we would use in owl class, or um, you could phrase it another way if your child doesn't take an owl class. Um, only words that have to do with our bodies or sexuality. And it was so fun and um, we laughed a lot. And it also gave me a good idea of um, what they uh, do and don't know. And it gave me an opportunity to put a couple of words in for my kid to be like, I don't know what that is. And I could explain it. Or if they put a word in, I could say, can you tell me what that means? Because I haven't heard that word. So it's a good way to have fun and get a sense of what they do and don't know or what they want to know. Um, another, another fun thing is um, making 
Plato body parts with exaggerated body parts. That's another fun playtime that can lead to good conversations and just be silly. Um, and role playing or charades is another one. Um, role playing can actually be really important and helpful. We do that a lot in our sexuality education classes to help kids have the tools to know how to respond when they are actually in certain social situations. And whether that's when we're talking about um, bullying situations or um, being at a party with friends and then alcohol comes into the picture and just practicing these situations where they might not, might not know what to do or might not be able to think about it in the moment if they're surprised by it. Um, role playing can give them language and tools around um, making healthy decisions. And it can just be really fun. It can be awkward and laugh and can be really fun. Um, a shared journal is a tool that I love also. It can be really just any notebook or book. There are um, journals specifically made for parents and children, not necessarily related to sexuality, but um, I think there's like a mother-daughter journal that is available, but really any notebook that you designate for this is great. And it's a good opportunity to write down um, to talk about things that you just can't speak out loud, especially for the kids. A lot of times kids will just be too embarrassed to ask certain things and having this journal um, opens the door wider for those conversations. And it doesn't have to only be about sexuality topics. It can be about anything difficult. Like if you have um, some kind of conflict and emotions are high and you step away, sometimes they can um, write you know, when this happens, this is how I feel. Um, just when you use one of these journals, um, just have a routine around how the other person knows that it's time to read it. So um, a, a good place to do that is put it on the other person's pillow. So if you have a, a child and you want to address something that they've been kind of resistant to or that you are worried that they will shut down with, you can write a question or a sentence or a message in that and leave it on their pillow so that they know that it's their turn to read and respond. That's a really fun one. Another important thing in talking to kids is affirm that they're normal. I think this is a really um, big barrier in especially the, the puberty ages or um, adolescents, bodies are so weird and so many things happen and, um, and there's just so such a wide range of what is normal. And uh, a lot of kids are comparing themselves to other people their age and, um, and I've just experienced a lot of kids who don't know if what their bodies are like or, or attractions that they're having or, any number of things, they don't know if it's normal and they need to hear really regularly that they are normal. There's a difference between um, what's normal and what's unhealthy. And so really affirming for them um, that they are normal is a helpful thing for kids that age to hear. Keep in mind that I don't know is legitimate. You don't have to have all the answers and you don't have to know how to answer um, a question. If, some, if a child asks you a question and you need some time to figure it out, then say, I don't know, but I will find out and we'll come back to this. That is absolutely legitimate. So let them teach you, be willing to learn from kids. Um, there's, it's amazing how much changes about sex and sexuality that, the terms especially that um, that come up, terms related to gender identity and sexual orientation, we're learning new, new terms all the time and that's a great thing for people to um, be able to hold on to identities. And it's a lot to keep up with. Um, and a lot of times kids are hearing some of these terms um, before parents because they'll be hearing them at school or through friends. And so let, let kids teach you sometimes. That's really empowering um, for kids to be able to share information with adults. Um, so there are 
new flags all the time related to sexual orientation. So if you see one that you don't know, you could call it out, say, I wonder what that flag means. Um, and your child may, may know or they may not, you could look it up together. You could be open to that opportunity. You don't have to necessarily have more answers than them about everything. Really important not to laugh at their questions. Totally fine to laugh about things together um, in conversations because bodies are just funny. Um, but when, when a child asks you a question, just um, really try not to laugh at them for their questions, no matter how cute or, or awkwardly it's asked. Um, it's, a, it's a respect um, issue. And if you want them to keep asking, don't make them feel silly for asking. Um, and no shaming. So, um, and, and no shaming across the board. So if you get a call from the school that um, your child Googled what is pornography um, or, or any kind of curiosity thing like that, that could be really um, embarrassing and alarming and set, set you into panic mode, but take a deep breath before that. It's, it's okay, it's natural curiosity, and um, do your best not to shame them, because shaming isn't, isn't going to be helpful in, in developing our kids. Um, there are so many resources online, and I, I did kind of a condensed list of resources, um, but explore those. There are so many good ones out there. However, um, don't encourage kids to Google things, to look things up, because if, and, and be explicit about that, you know, caution them against um, looking things up on the internet related to sexuality, because they're going to see a lot of things that are not healthy. Um, pornography is not sexuality education. There's so much in porn that is not healthy or um, accurate or um, positive. So we don't want kids to be running into things like that by accident or uh, learning things that aren't um, healthy and safe for them. So it's okay for you to look up um, healthy sexuality education resources, but make sure your kids aren't doing that. If they do by accident, talk with them about it without shaming, but try to discourage them. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing there. So, Sorry, just checking the chat because I hadn't seen. Okay. So that was a lot. Um, and really the, the bottom line is just um, be confident that you will do a great job <laughs> and you're not gonna damage your kids. Um, and if you give the wrong information or if it feels really awkward and you do make a mistake, it's okay. It's okay to acknowledge that. It's okay to have a redo or to apologize if a mistake does happen. Um, but really the practicing um, of awkward conversations is so liber liberating um, because the more we do it, the, the easier it gets and it can actually become really fun. And it can be amazing. Um, getting into a good habit of talking with kids to the point where they are really engaging, getting beyond the point of, um, of them kind of like cringing and, and trying not to listen. Um, once they do start engaging, that is really special and so helpful in hearing what's on their minds and what they're wondering about. So um, I also wanna talk a little bit about about um, body autonomy and consent that did come up a little bit here. And Laura had asked me to address those because um, a lot of parents are looking for information on that, especially with younger children. So I wanna address some of that. Uh, go back to my slide here. Okay. So um, there is a lot of information widely available about 
all of this. Um, and so some of it might be very, uh, seem very intuitive and it still helps to name it because you, you know more than you think about, about these things. So number one, um, anatomically correct names for body parts, um, including genitalia, um, super important for safety reasons. If the worst happened and a child is, um, sexually assaulted, it is really important for children to be able to name what parts of their body have been touched um, without the cutesy names so that we, so that um, it's clear what has happened. Um, and, and just also it's again in that hidden message using the real names for body parts um, gives the message that we're not embarrassed and um, afraid to say the real body parts because it, they are part of part of all of us. Be clear about safe and unsafe actions and safe and unsafe people. So be really clear from an early age what kinds of um, touching or other behaviors are safe and what specifically is not safe and and what kinds of touching um, people should not be doing. Uh, to children and identify with them who are safe people. Um, it's not ideal for, for kids to think that parents are the only safe people they can talk to um, because one, if something um, awful happened, parents, uh, children often won't tell their parents for various reasons um, and just for the purposes of um, later being in trouble, worrying they'll be in trouble with their parents or, um, or you know, uh, being embarrassed with their parents, it is really important to have multiple safe people. So helping them identify who those people are, and this goes for kids of any age, really, um, from little, little kids right through teens. So helping them know who that is, whether that's um, specific family members or guidance counselor at school, school nurse, their doctor. This is really for you to decide. I, I can't tell you who the safe people are in your child's life, but um, be clear with yourself on that and express that directly to kids. Practice asking permission. So I love that about this part of the pandemic. Um, we've, we've gotten some practice as a culture asking permission before hugging or um, around masks. Um, I've, seen, I've seen that so much even around shaking hands. I, I see people asking, are you shaking hands right now? And that pra practice around any kind of um, contact that we normally would have taken for granted and just assumed people um, would be okay with is great practice for consent education because that has typically been a barrier to consent, to consent is the awkwardness of asking, can I kiss you <laughs> or, or any other um, behavior. So the fact that we're doing that now um, makes me really excited. And likewise, be deliberate about practicing that with your kids and um, with your kids toward other people guiding them to ask someone before hugging them um, and giving them that language and, and that habit of checking in with someone instead of just assuming that something's okay. Um, talk to them about secrets. What kinds of secrets are okay and not okay? So if you buy a gift together and are going to surprise someone with it, you know, that's, that's a great secret to keep from mom. Don't tell mom what you got her for her birthday until her birthday. So that kind of secret is okay, but um, any, you know, really name what kinds of secrets are not okay. You know, a grown up or a kid that asks um, your child not to uh, tell about touching or um, anything unsafe. Going back to that um, conversation about safe and unsafe actions, making sure the child is aware that um, some secrets are not okay and what they don't want to be keeping for secrets. And it's okay to say no to adults. Um, that's, a, that's a thing a lot of kids are 
really afraid of saying no to adults, but make sure they know that sometimes that is okay. Give them choices whenever possible. Um, experience is a great teacher. So on a cold day, sometimes giving them the choice of a jacket or not, they're likely to put the jacket on, but um, the more often that we can give kids choices um, affirms their autonomy. And we can be a little tricky with giving choices. We can ask, would you like to put your shoes on or would you like me to put them on? Um, but that is, um, even just that kind of choice is powerful in giving them ownership over their own, own bodies. Um, giving them choice in washing at bath time. Um, would you like to wash your penis or would you like me to? Or, um, you know, giving those options also is good practice for autonomy and consent. Role playing. Again, I know I've mentioned it several times. Role, I mentioned role playing with your own peers around answering kids' questions, but role playing in, right here in this part um, refers to uh, consent. So role play being in a situation where um, they are able to refuse uh, a hug or any other kind of um, physical contact that they don't want. Um, so this especially it, with um, relatives, um, relatives often don't ask about hugging and sometimes just aren't into it, um, but practice with kids around those situations and you can make it a little theater project if you want. Um, but giving them that practice helps them in that moment use their voice as well. And related to that, be their voice when necessary. If they're in a situation and they can't yet um, speak up about that, it's okay for you to do that. Um, Again, with relatives, make sure um, that your kids know that you will support them, that you have their backs, and make sure you're ready to back that up, um, even with their grandparents. So um, you can ask your child, would you like to hug them or would you rather have a high five or something else? And it's okay if you don't want any of those. Um, and, and just don't betray the child in front of the relative. Um, don't say, oh, I guess she's just grouchy today. Um, or she's just tired. It doesn't matter why they don't want to be touched or hugged. Try, they don't want that, and that's perfectly fine, and then move on, and don't dwell on it, and then if the, the other person protests, then just be frank with them. We get to choose our contact with people, and they know that if they do something you don't want, then they'll listen and respect you too. Stop sharing. So one more thing that I, I just wanted to bring up in all of this, a question I get a lot from parents um, is what if my kids start telling their friends the things that either that they're learning in classes um, because we are giving so much um, information, but also um, parents sometimes are afraid to give their kids information because they're afraid that their kids will share with kids on the playground. And my response is that's okay. It's fine for them to share that information um, and just be ready to stand by them in that. Um, you're not gonna give them information that is um, harmful. And if, if other parents haven't yet gotten to that with their kids, that's okay. They, they can choose to once, once their kids have approached them having heard from it, but um, there's nothing wrong with, with good quality information. And especially as they get to be teens, if your kids are the ones that are correcting bad information, false information, or um, helping to um, inform their peers, then in my mind, that is, that is a great thing. Um, because they're modeling those sexuality conversations that we all should be having. And then just my last piece is, how do we know what's age appropriate? And that's gonna be different for every child. Um, they can often handle more than we give them credit for, like I said, and they will be getting messages from everywhere. Um, 
TVs that are left on all over the place, at friends and relatives' homes, in restaurants, in waiting areas, magazines, billboards, movies, overhearing conversations in public. Um, kids are picking up on so many things. So um, they're, they're getting information already that is not age appropriate. So helping to put that into the context of what their experiences are and what they're um, able to understand, you are their best translators for that because you know them so well. So that's what I have. I'm wondering if there are any questions. Well, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A or you can put them in the chat and you can send them just to hosts and panelists um, so that only Jen and I will see them if that's how you'd prefer to do it. I'm going to get the, the link to the document that I put together with resources and I'll put that link in the chat. Great. I have a question um, and it's about, so I don't have kids and I'm wondering if there are certain things that you can suggest that are like behavioral changes from perhaps what our generation was taught for folks who, you know, work with kids or have friends with kids but are not the caregiver. So I wouldn't be having those conversations. But for example, um, one thing I've adjusted after reading that many adults comment on young girls outfits but not boys so that's something we do much more often um with children who are presenting as female right so i and that sort of teaches them that their physical appearance is one of their most important traits so i've tried to stop doing that i've also tried to work with parents to make sure that you're never you know forcing physical contact on a child like a hug it makes it sound like I did that before. You know what I'm saying, though. And also intervening when I see people who are from a different generation for whom that is more normal. Like, just, you know, make sure that you give your great-grandmother a kiss or whatever it is. So I'm wondering if you have any other thoughts about things that, you know, friends of kids can do to help promote some of these values. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, Yes, so but if you don't have children or even if you do and you are exposed to other people's kids, being an ally in this, I agree you're not going to initiate um, informative conversations around a lot of sexuality topics. But yes, uh, um, modeling the things around consent and body autonomy are very helpful, especially if it's a child that looks up to you, you know, asking them, um, would you like a hug or would you rather not? And, and giving that second option, would you rather not? And really making them feel like that's okay, but modeling asking is um, a great example. And um, really any of the things that I said that are outside of, <laughs> of um, how to give them information and, you know, like you're not gonna role play with them, you're not gonna hold, journals with them, but a lot of, a lot of it does still, um, does still apply. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would say modeling, modeling um, respect and um, really honoring where kids are and not, not pushing them to suit your own um, comfort is, is ideal. Being, and someone just said, being the safe and trusted adult is huge. It is, it's such an honor when you can earn that with, um, with someone else's kids or your own kids. It's a really big deal and um, hold, that, hold that power <laughs> well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and that, that point about not commenting on outfits it's great, and, and it's, it's okay to comment on an outfit if it's clear that somebody put something together and is, you know, they're feeling it and there's nothing wrong with offering a compliment. Um, and I think any gender sometimes would appreciate that. So mm -hmm. you know, as much as we don't want to over-focus on 
on children presenting as girls and commenting on their outfits. Um, maybe we need to be also affirming everybody else's outfits once in a while. I like that. Um, the condition of their um, worth. <laughs> Yeah, and similarly, smiling. I, I, you know, I grew up in an era of um, people telling little girls that they should smile because it makes them look pretty. And I cringe so much about that. And you know, I rarely hear it now, but sometimes um, I do hear that. And we should really not be doing that. Affirming or acknowledging people's feelings and not suggesting that they they put it. Put a, put a face on for us. So I want to encourage, um, just because someone did say something in the chat about modeling and teaching consent to a uh, young boy, that we did have one of these programs on consent. And I find it, found it a very valuable program, even if you think you know what it means, even if you don't think that you, you know, are regularly in situations where this is going to come up, it's still really interesting to examine our own sort of assumptions and the way we've been culturally conditioned. And there's some helpful stuff in that talk about, you know, um, discussing the positive aspects of consent and, and really for all of us, you know, changing our mindset so that it's not around making sure you don't do something bad and more around what a valuable experience people can create with each other when they're asking for consent. Yeah, and I love the idea um, and for adults, consent can be really sexy and um, it can be really playful for adults or kids um, asking for consent. So I see a question, is there a parent component to the OWL program? So starting there, um, yes, in a sense, um, for especially the fourth through sixth grade uh, curriculum, there is a parent guide that follows the OWL curriculum. So parents can check in regularly with what exactly the kids are learning each week. Um, beyond that, in, in our congregation, we do offer um, periodic parent consent, I mean, peri periodic parent um, discussion groups that are in conjunction with some of the older kids being an owl. So it doesn't happen every week that the kids are in class, but we do it periodically for parents to check in together, either around how things are going in class or um, things that are coming up with their kids outside of class in their social situations or, or um, a space to just really um, talk together around how it's going parenting around sexuality. Um, and the other part also, can someone join at any age or they, do they have to start the OWL program at a certain age? So in our programs, um, well, really in any OWL program, you can't just drop in. Um, leading up to the class, there's a mandatory parent orientation so that we're very clear around um, what will be shared in the class and how it works and the logistics. And then the kids start their class and there's a lot of work put into group bonding and trust building and creating safe space and talk about, um, we don't share other people's stories outside of the group and things like that. And so having someone just join um, mid session is not conducive to protecting that um, safe group space. Uh, plus the, the lessons do to a certain degree build on each other. And so coming in midway is not going to be emotionally safe for, for the kid because they haven't gotten the background um, leading up to the point where they are um, in that. And the Google Docs require permission. So let me just change it. That should change the permission to see the Google Doc. Maybe someone could try that Google Doc again and let me know if they're able to. Oh, somebody's on there. Great. Yeah, looks good to me. Thank you for changing that. Um, I will share that Google Doc in a follow-up email. Um, 
from me to all of our registrants and I will also share the links that I put in the chat. Going back to that question about parent component to the OWL program. Um, so the, there's the parts that I said, beyond that there, like I said before, there are adult curricula for OWL. Um, those aren't parent specific. Those are for adults um, and their own sexuality. But then we, we at South Church have started offering a class called Parents and Caregivers as Sexuality Educators that is really similar to OWL. It's, it's um, closely connected, similar topics, but it is really centered on um, parents exploring, raising um, sexually healthy um, kids. So that's not directly an OWL program, but it's, it's very similar and specifically for parents and caregivers. And then, so to clarify, my daughter would have, would have, would have to take take an L in the fifth grade. She can't start in seventh. Oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood that question before. Um, no, the the different curricula uh, stand alone. Um, so, right, we often we have kids all the time that come into the seventh grade program who have not had any of the previous L classes or even the high school program not having any before. So, any of those curricula you can jump in at the start of a session. I thought the question was um, if you could jump into the seventh grade one midway through offering, which is what we can't do. And, and related to that, so the curricula, the, we offer it when kids are in fifth grade just because that is um, the, the program that we're offering because we offer all the programs too in our congregation. But the curricula for fifth grade is written for grades four to six. And so sometimes we will um, have kids that are one grade different than fifth, most often sixth. We will never have a class that has three age ranges, three grades in one, um, because that's too much of a, a developmental span. But we, we can do fifth and sixth grade together as long as we've had a conversation and have determined that that, that will be a good fit socially and emotionally and developmentally. And likewise with seventh grade, that's written for seventh through ninth grade. Um, so we'll occasionally have an eighth grade. And those especially come into play if someone, say someone missed OWL in seventh grade and they're in eighth grade and they really wanna do it. Um, We'll, we'll have that conversation and if it all seems okay, then we'll, we'll include them. Yeah, and if there's anyone who is just really um, excited about that program and would ever want to think about being an OWL facilitator, the, the program does require um, really specific training. You have to be OWL trained specifically and we have to have, you know, two specifically owl trained adults in the classroom all the time. Um, even subs have to be owl trained and we're always needing new instructors. And the way I got into this was um, I was a new parent a long time ago and someone approached me and asked if I would be interested in teaching a sex ed class for seventh and eighth graders. And I freaked out, I just froze because the idea of doing that seemed so scary at that time. And that's how I knew that I needed to do it because I would be having kids that age and that would be a topic I would need to navigate. So I was like, oh shoot, this seems super scary. And I know it means I have to say yes. So I did it and uh, I loved it. The training was just so much fun and liberating. And then working with the kids was just so rewarding. And the, um, the amount that I learned in that process was huge. And I just never went back. I, I went for more trainings and um, yeah, now it's, now it's a significant significant part of my job. So if it's something you'd ever even consider, I would highly recommend it. And OWL does not have to be taught in um, a church program. It's It, it can be taught in communities and schools. Um, so yeah, if, if you're looking to start a program in a different setting, um, that's a great place to start too. And we always need new um, instructors also. Great, well, I wanna give it uh, one more minute to see if we have any more questions. 
now is a really good time. We have an expert here. So if you have any, you know, specific situations maybe that you'd like to ask about with your kids, we'll give you another minute to do that. Yeah, I mean, there's so much we could, we could talk for days and days and days. And um, the best is just being in a group and having conversations. And then we can really pinpoint um, specific topics and scenarios. Um, so I feel like I just gave you a bunch of things that I could, but certainly if there are any specifics, then let me know. I'm happy to work through those with you. My nine-year-old asked me what sexual assault was. So this is a great example of, um, thank you for that question, for um, a situation where you want to think about what information is the right amount of information for them and what is developmentally appropriate. So sexual assault is a terrible thing and um, a nine-year-old likely would not benefit from hearing the details of that, right? But um, if you think about your nine-year-old and they've heard about this sexual assault term, um, we also don't want to just let that go. They've likely heard, they've picked up that there's something negative about it. So using language that is like, um, unfortunately, there are times where people do really awful things to each other. And um, it is my job to protect you, to make sure that isn't something that happens to you. But there are things that, that unfortunately do happen sometimes. And um, that can involve um, doing behaviors to people that involve their body parts that they shouldn't be touching or doing things with. So using, using um, language that your child can connect to um, and giving them enough information to feel okay about um, having an idea of what the question is without overloading them and without getting into um, explicit information about what rape is or um, really any, any um, situation like that. But he didn't even know what sex was, so it was hard to know where to start, even though I've talked to him about it. So you don't have to know what intercourse is to, to have an idea of sexual assault, right? Um, there are all different kinds of sexual assault, really. And it, the, the details, again, the details of that don't matter. I, at nine, um, you know, I, I would imagine your child knows that uh, genital contact is um, not something that is safe, um, certainly for, um, you know, an adult and a child. Um, you know, you can decide when it's appropriate to talk about um, safe and consensual genital contact with them, but um, it is also okay to let them know that, um, you know, that people do, unfortunately, all different kinds of bad things. People rob banks and people use guns on each other. And unfortunately, people also hurt each other's bodies in lots of kinds of ways. And, and let them keep asking questions. Thank them for asking a question. I think that's a great thing too when kids have um, the, the courage and the trust in you to ask them a question. Acknowledging that is, is really helpful. And then hopefully as they think about what you've said, um, they'll come back with more. Another thing in the OWL class is we have a question box. And at the end of every class, everybody gets an index card and a pencil, and you can write anything you want on it. And you have to write something, even if it's, I don't have a question, you can ask anything you want. And then they all go in the box and the instructors answer, they address every, um, every card at the beginning of the next class. So it's a great opportunity for kids to ask these kinds of questions anonymously. And the instructors answer them with that kind of language, whatever is um, appropriate for the age group they're talking to. Um, the only time they really don't answer is when kids ask them about their personal experiences. Like when, how old were you the first time you had sex? Um, an instructor will say, that is not an appropriate thing for me to share with you. I can tell you that it is different for everyone. Sexual experience is um, different for everyone, um, but it's not appropriate for me to tell you that about myself. 
And as a parent, that's okay to say too, if they ask directly about you. I wanted to say that if anyone has um, questions about books, I think probably there are some books in those resources that you shared, Jen, um, but please feel free to come into the library and check that out. Um, maybe if, I know one of my coworkers is here, if, um, if she would like to throw in the chat, like say the call number, in fact, I could do that give me just a second because um actually what i'll tell you is at the library we have a little handout that says tough topics it's also a sign that we have up in our bathroom and it has uh the call number in our nonfiction section that corresponds to a lot of different topics that you might not want to ask somebody out loud about and sex is one of them um there are also lots of other things on there like domestic violence or addiction that kind of thing um, and so you can pick one of those up and use it as a marker and go find that call number on the shelf and pick out the books yourself that way. We also have self checks at the library so you can check out to yourself with your library card without ever coming across the desk. So if this is a topic that you'd like to learn more about for yourself and you don't feel comfortable chatting about it in person, we totally get that. So those resources are available to you if you use our library. And actually a lot of libraries these days will have a sign or a handout of that kind. And if they don't, you can tell them to contact us and we'll share our files too. That's awesome. Thank you, Laura. I did not yeah. put parent um, books on the resources page. I figured you'd be a better resource for that than I would. Um, I did put some for kids that I especially like, um, just to And then I did put a lot of um, great podcasts and websites um, for parents on, on that list. That's great, thank you. And I'll just point out that if you are a Portsmouth Public Library card holder, we do have a parenting section. Um, it's over by the board books. And I know one of my coworkers is here. So if you have any specific recommendations, you can throw them in the chat and we'll share them with folks. Okay, any last questions for Jen? I like to give it a little bit more space in these programs because sometimes it takes a minute to sort of formulate your question on these topics, doesn't it? Sure, yeah. I would just say to parents, you are doing so much more now than ever. <laughs> so, you know, you. We're not perfect. No, no one of us is um, perfect. And so just give yourself a lot of grace in that. Um, I, yeah, I want people to know that I recognize that you're doing your best and all the things you are doing are amazing. Um, yeah, not That's easy. Lovely. To give a gig. Do you mean that we're, they're doing more now? Oh, thank you, Molly. And my coworker sharing a couple things in the chat. Um, yep, and she did it to everyone. So I will actually save these and share them in my follow-up email is along with Jen's resources. Um, and someone saying, thank you, this has been very educational. And I was just gonna say, did you mean that parents are doing more now because the pandemic is insane? Or do you mean the parents are doing more around sex education than perhaps the previous generation or both? I, I mean, um, related to the pandemic and yeah. there's more an anxiety among kids than ever. Just, it's, it's just, there's a lot, a lot to, mm -hmm. to handle right now. So mm -hmm. to lift that up and to not, um, to not let um, any of the, the enormity of this topic um, weigh on you in any way. Yes. I think that's very good advice. All right, well, um, Molly has thrown some great links in the chat to um, some parenting books and I will share those in a follow-up email perhaps tomorrow or the next day. Um, so you'll get all of this, but while I have you for one more minute, I'll just throw some of the other links in the chat, um, including our event feedback form. So I encourage you to fill that out. It really helps us find out what kinds of things people are looking for at the library, what you thought about this program, 
and so on. And we're really glad you all could join us today. So thank you for coming. And thank you, Jen, so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for everyone who's here. And thank you, Laura, for your good work. Yeah. All right, great. Well, have a great night, everybody.